They need men. You know, uh, you know we were talking, uh, we actually were talking, uh, you know, you know my channel is men, and, and that's why we're going to uh, Iron Sharpens Iron uh, next Saturday. Uh, the Word of God commands men to lead, okay, commands men to step up, commands men to be the example, the, the, the light. Not to be the dictator or the controller, but the example in his home. Uh, in the church, uh, any place. So, uh, you know, and the thing that's lacking today, this not been a, a this not a new battle uh, that's been going on. Uh, uh, you know, churches lack manpower, and what I mean by that is, in the, in the gender sense, they lack manpower. Uh, uh, you know, when kids come in uh, to church, uh, you know, we can talk about those kind of things. They they need to see male examples. They need to see men that are excited about Christ. They need to see men that that are that are. Uh, excited about being saved themselves, uh, you know, our, our ladies, they're great at it, okay, our ladies, they're always excited, <laughs> you know, got a smile on their face, and they always got, you know, and the men get caught up with the responsibilities of a lot of things, but they don't realize how important their role is, and if you get in scripture, you know, you'll find how important God says your role is, okay, uh, we are responsible to be examples, we are responsible, responsible to live lives, and God lives as men before our kids, uh, so, I'm going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 with a real quick prayer. We're talking about prayer. And, uh, and I'll try not to keep us past one. But remember, I'm off today, so this is my off day. I've been preaching on no prayer, no results. You don't pray, you don't expect results, Amen. So you got to pray. You got to go to God. You got to go to God, expect to receive something from Him, believing that He's going to do what He said He's going to do. You can't just uh, put some words out there. There's no sense, kind of, you know, no really no sense praying if you don't believe in what you're saying, or you don't believe God's going to do what He said He's going to do. Uh, uh, and I think that's what what people don't understand about the importance of prayer. When you go boldly before the throne of grace. You've got to go there believing what you're presenting before God, that you can stand up and receive that grace and mercy, okay, and, and peace that you need. Amen? And, and the thing, like it was mentioned today, you know, five minutes uh, in prayer, I mean, just for young kids. How many of you just spent five minutes? I'm not going to raise your hand, but, you know, usually I do, because it doesn't matter if you're you know, honesty is a good place to start. But five minutes in prayer, period. I mean, you know, sometimes taking five minutes to do anything is burdensome today because we're so caught up with everything else, we're so busy, okay, that, that bottom line, we can't even give us five minutes. So it, it's hard to sit there and say, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, God, I'll give you five minutes. You can't give yourself five minutes. The important thing is if you give God five minutes, you're getting five minutes. Okay, remember that, that message not too long ago? When you give somebody time, and I've written blogs on that time thing. If you give someone time, guess what you're gaining? Time. Okay, you can't help but to gain time. When you give someone else time, you're gaining time. It's amazing. When you give from a give of yourself, what you get back. If you if you have a genuine heart for that kind of thing. Same thing with praying. You give to God, God's going to give back. But you've got to give to God believing that God's going to give back, okay? We don't go expecting, we go knowing. It's great to expect things. But it's great to go to God just knowing God's going to do what He's going to do. And the only way you find that out is when you go to God and you expect God to do that and you get up believing that He's taking care of it already. Those are different ways to pray. First Timothy, and I need to get there. I mean, it's there. See, I gave you time to get there and I'm not even there. Look at this. Wow. I didn't have it marked. It's usually I cheat put that little ribbon in there so I can make it look like I'm really intelligent, smart, on top of a pastor, but I'm usually not. But Paul writing Timothy was giving Timothy instruction. Timothy was a young pastor. He was giving Timothy instruction in the church. But what I like about this chapter is what he urged him to do. So when someone urges you to do something, there's some importance to that. Amen? So when the pastor urges you to pray and encourage you to pray, there's a reason for that. Because without prayer in the body of Christ, we don't exist. We really don't. Okay? Prayer... Does what? Like I said last week, prayer draws us into communion with God. It draws us into a relationship with God. It draws us into spending time with God, okay, getting to know who He is. It's easy to preach that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, but if you don't go to a God that you believe that out of, okay, if He loves you so much, guess what He's got for you? Time. Amen? That we're the ones that don't have time. God has time. 
and he wants you and he wants your time. He wants to spend time with you. That's kind of like the general kind of prayer. Now people say there's all different kinds of prayer out there, but one kind of prayer is just when you just sit and commune with God. You're not asking him for anything, okay? You're not even intercessing for anybody. You're just sitting with God and having a conversation. That's prayer. God likes that kind of prayer. You start spending five minutes doing that, next thing you know, no, you're going to be spending 30 minutes doing that. And the time's going to fly by. This is like I shared last year. I shared with God. I've been encouraging the guys to go to Iron Sharpens Iron. And I said, last year was so exciting, so powerful. When we left that place at 4 30, asked my son, we couldn't believe it was over with already. Good. But they prayed. They were praising God. 1,100 men excited for Jesus. It was the most exciting time I ever had. Usually you go to some of those events, you still got a bunch of empty seats. Who in the empty seat in the house? 1,100 seats. People standing. Men praising God. Men weeping. Men coming before God praying. It was exciting. Kept me excited for a whole other year. That's how excited it was. Of course, you know, some of you are saying, well, those people want to excite you. Doesn't matter. If pastor's excited about it, then it's exciting. I don't care what anybody says. Most pastors aren't even going to these things anymore. They're too busy to go. Okay, I'm not too busy to go. Why? Because I need to get fed. I need to get nurtured. I need to stay excited. I need to get powered up. I need my prayer life improved. That's what it's about. If your pastor's where he needs to be and doing those kind of things, guess who's going to follow? You got it. Because you're going to trust in the God that we're preaching about. Because God answers prayer. Let's read the scripture, starting with chapter 2, 1 Timothy. Now listen to this. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Okay? Urge there. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires what? All people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as, as a ransom for all, which the testimony given in the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. I teach the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouraging of your word. We thank you for the challenge of your word. Father, for us to be doing those things. Father, if we want to grow, then we have to pray. We've got to spend time with you. It takes more than, than Sunday morning. It takes more than Bible, uh, Bible studies on Wednesday evening. It takes a daily time with you, Lord, to refresh us, to renew us, to uh, just to, to teach us how to be quiet, just to teach us how to be still, just to teach us to listen. Because, Father, even though we're Christians, even though we're believers, we don't listen well. We don't stay still well. We don't be quiet well. It's, it's things that we have to learn. But that's why we're here. Help us, teach us, guide us, direct us. Father, if any of us are struggling into this thing, we most are. Father, right now, teach us. Teach us to be still. Teach us the benefits of those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, uh, uh, you know, like I said before, two ways to pray badly. <laughs> one is don't pray at all. Yeah, that's one way not to, pray, not to pray badly is don't pray. The second one is pray selfishly. Okay? For your own desires, for your own passion, for your own things, says James. You know, you have not, because you ask not, but when you ask, you ask miss, but for your own passion and desires. So the Bible tells us how not to pray. Okay? So, slow? I'm going too fast? Really? Okay, you know what that means then? You need to get excited and catch up. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You're in trouble. Anyhow, did I read too fast, too? Oh, you do the reading part. <laughs> I see. I'm sorry. I was just so Thomas never would understand what's going on. I get excited and I get going 100 miles an hour. So Chris slows me down in my reading. Okay, so everybody can understand what I'm saying. And obviously Bill's been given a dangerous responsibility here that, he, that he's taken out to slow me down in my speaking. But I just get excited. You know that. So thank you. I never get embarrassed about it. If some of you need to slow down, just go, Rich, you can just do that. Now, if I sit down, make sure <laughs> Rich will be going like this. No, no. <laughs> but two ways not to pray. Not at all, and to pray selfishly. 
Do I need to go on my southern, more, more southern boat? Would that be better? Okay, I reckon we'll slow down then. My daughter will like that. Never mind her sweet tea. Man, you want sweet tea, my daughter. Man, it goes about two and a half cups in a little gallon thing. It almost turns it white, but man, that's the best southern tea you ever had. There are numerous ways to pray. But obviously, you know, most important, we have to pray without doubting. We have to pray believing. Uh, the Word of God says, Matthew uh, 21, 22, Jesus, whatever you ask, believe in, okay? Or by faith, okay, are the important things. And those are things that I want you to ingrain in your mind that, that when you're taking time to pray, am I still enough? <laughs> when you're taking time to pray, believe what you're praying about, okay? Trust God to what you're praying for, okay? There's really no sense. It's like going to the mechanic and saying, I want my brakes fixed. But only do the one on the left front. I think the one on the right front is pretty good shape. Too bad, but you know, they don't use that much anymore, so it's no big deal. Okay, same way in our prayer life. Don't half-step God. When you go to God, go to Him completely. Don't go to Him partly. Okay? When you go to God and you're praying for your wife, don't leave you out. Okay? Lord, what is it you'd have me to do for my wife? What is it you'd have me to do for my family? Okay? Help me to be what I need to be to my family. Then you might want to step to your wife. It's always dangerous to start with your wife first. The problem is your wife walks in here all she hears about is, Lord, you need to tighten her up a little bit. <laughs> Ask her to make me dinner. And you know what she told me? You can call on the phone just as easy as I can. <laughs> that, I was done. that I was done today. My poor wife. You need to pray for my wife. You, see? you know, I, I don't like chicken. I mean, I don't eat chicken, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I really kind of like, it seems like everything she makes is chicken-based. <coughs> you know, it's like chicken with mushrooms on it. Chicken with orange sauce on it. Doesn't make any difference what you put on it, chicken's chicken. Now, steak. But anyhow, yeah, we eat a lot of chicken. My wife, uh, driver nuts, I'm like, we're having chicken again. And, and uh, she's like, I can't believe she's, but you order wings every night, so that's different. Something different about wings. Now, some, of you, some of you ladies out there going like, please, it's chicken. No. It is chicken, but if it's done a certain way, it's better than ribs. And it's better than breasts. And it's better than those kind of things. Hey, now, pray for my wife. You guys are killing me out there. But anyhow, we need to pray believe. We need to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Amen. He paved the way. He did those kind of things. But there are different ways to pray. Supplication. Notice that they said supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving. Supplications, you know, mean you're, you're petitioning God for certain things. A good illustration, I thought, was the prayer of Jabez in, in 1 Chronicles. Let me read that to you. This is, this is a prayer of supplication. It says, uh, starting verse 9, 1 Chronicles chapter 4. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Uh, if you want to, they'll turn there. Old Testament. In the beginning. Genesis and Exodus. First and second Kings Chronicles. There we go. Starting verse 9. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brother. And his mother called his name Jabez because I bore him in pain. This is Jabez's prayer. He got Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that he would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your right hand might be with me. That you keep me from harm so that I might not bring pain. And God granted that. That's a type of supplication. That's bringing a petition before God to do something with yourself or to do something with Him. Okay? Now, some people say, well, He was asking me for that sort of a selfish prayer. No. Not really. He was just asking God to do something with Him, broaden His border. For us as Christians, what do we want God to do? We want God to broaden our borders. We want our ministry border lines to spread out, don't we? So that's not a bad prayer. So when we're making petitions, asking God for supplication, Lord, this is what we want to do. Give us some direction. Give us some guidance. And we're not going to move until we see you move. We're not going to move until we hear you move us. Or we see the door opened up for us. Sometimes we get jumpy, don't we? You know, we pray, it feels good, let's do it. And all of a sudden it's kind of like the door gets slammed on your nose. You don't know what happened, you don't know what's wrong. It's because you really didn't wait for God. You know, we got to trust God to do in us what we ask Him to do. We're praying about a building. We know that. 
Okay? But we just don't want to jump into any building, do we? And why? Because we want to still be able to do what God's provided for us to do. You know, the worst thing for us to do is, is do like what happens in a lot of situations. We have to back up, regroup, reorganize, rebudgetize, call our missionaries, apologize. And we shouldn't be spending all that time like that in the Word of God. We should be prayed up. We should be moving forward. We should be waiting on God. And when God moves us, guess what? The other stuff's going to work right along with us. Amen? Okay? It's important to pray. Uh, important to pray. I want to just, that to me was their prayer supplication. In prayer, like I said, just spending time with God. Okay? I, I don't want to get through it. I want to get into intercession because it's very important. Uh, intercessory prayer. But prayers are just that time you spend with God, maybe not asking for anything. It's just spending time getting to know God. You know, and then he says intercessions. And what are intercessions? That's going on behalf of someone. Okay? Going with that someone. Going before that someone. Praying for that someone that may not be able to pray for themselves. Or that someone that's struggling in prayer. Somebody that's hurting. Someone that's sick. That needs prayer. Okay? We need to intercede on that person's behalf. There may be some spiritual battles going on. We need to intercede for that. But we've got, again, the important thing is believing. When you pray for someone, when you intercede for somebody, you've got to pray that God's going to provide the need. Amen? If they need deliverance, you're going to pray for deliverance. Thanking God, believing God that it's a done deal. And then you move on to the next thing. Some things we need to just leave with God and move on. There's some things that you continue to pray about. Salvation, for instance. When you're praying for somebody to be saved, that's intercessory prayer. That's what this scripture talks about, huh? That God wants people saved. We need to intercede on people's behalf. We assume sometimes everyone comes into the body of Christ, they're saved. Not necessarily so. But we need to be interceding on their behalf, amen? Be like that grandma or that, that, that aunt that's prayed for 40 years for her nephew to get saved. Or that mom that prayed endlessly for her son to get saved. Okay, that's the intercession. Now some people will say, my goodness, poor you. She trusted and believed. She wasn't <laughs> praying because she doubted God was going to do it. She was just trusting and believing that God was going to do it. Ultimately, you hear the testimony how that son got saved, how that niece got saved, how that niece was watching. But, but it takes commitment to prayer. It takes trust in God to do what he said he's going to do. And it's just like reading these scriptures here. Think about it. I heard supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Why? We benefit. Automatically. See, there's a, the neat thing about God. We don't even have to ask anything really for ourselves. Even though Jesus prayed for himself and we can pray for ourselves, guess what? If we spend time in prayer, guess whose needs are going to get taken care of? Oh, and we're not even going to have to ask. Because we're just doing and being obedient to God's word. We're in prayer. We're praying for others. Okay? We're praying for a building. Or we're praying for souls. Or we're doing what? Praying for deliverance. We're praying for demons to be cast out. It don't make any difference. Some people, how many people don't believe there's demons out there? Some people believe that's all Hollywood. Where do you think Hollywood got that from? Okay? It's real. We've got to be interceding on people's behalf for those kinds of things. But listen to this again. That we may lead. A peaceful and quiet, godly and dignified and be dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. What? Who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Man, that should be our heart's desire as a church, praying for the souls of the lost. It's just like they were talking about here, praying for our children to be saved. I know we have kids, we have little ones in here that aren't saved. That should be a parent's heart's desire. Anything that you're, that you're interceding on behalf of your child. Lord, I know my child may not understand, but Lord, help us to be what we need to be. When that child gets to where they need to be, and where you bring them, they're going to want to know. Right. They're going to hunger. They're going to desire. Amen. Think about that. Right. That's intercession. That's interceding on behalf of your family. But the chance of the church interceding on behalf of its children. Every child that comes in here because they were raised up in a church family does not mean they're saved. We need to be interceding for those children. Look at Danny. Where's Danny? I wish Danny was here. You excited, wasn't it? How excited were we on Christmas Eve? Wasn't that the most exciting moment that we had? Christmas Eve. We're having a Christmas Eve service like everybody else. Next thing I know, a, a nine-year-old kid's coming up and saying, I got saved. And he was excited. Nine years old, I got saved. 
Remember how excited we were? That excitement should never stop. We should be on our knees thanking God daily for Danny and thanking God that every child he brings in here, we are hungering and desire for their salvation. That's what God wants us to do. That's intercession. Going on behalf of our young people. The devil wants our young people, amen? Some of you guys got kids out there that are not doing what God wants them to do. Breaks your heart. Breaks your heart. Then you need to pray for them. You need to pray, trust, and, and believe that God's going to do something in their life. Don't give up on them. Don't get upset at them like I have. My kids had a pretty hard road to go. I'm not even picking the teeth and getting them laughing. You ask my children. I did it wrong for a long time. I really did. I mean, so wrong that my son was listening to Christian rap music. I beat him down and Chris, I didn't want that. Music in my house. But I broke his spirit when he came down one day and just threw all his CDs in front of my face. And, you know, and I broke his heart. Because I wasn't grateful. He was listening to God. He could have been doing a million other things. But I went down finally, humbled myself, or God humbled me. And I said, the Lord, do something with me. You know, I'm, I can't be cleaning people up. You've heard me say that. It's not our job to clean them. It's our job to catch them. I was too busy cleaning that I was missing out on some great and wonderful things. When I finally went down and sat down and watched that kid skateboard and do some of the things he did, I'm like, wow. Now he's jumping out of airplanes. I think he's on medication. I blame Karen for that. So I said, well, I mean, you need to pray for Karen. See how she fell short raising her children up? My daughter fixes everybody else's hair. Loves doing it. But then you, when you look at her hair, it's like Jen. They didn't come to find out. See, I'm wrong because she is. That's a style. <laughs> I don't understand that. But see, I used to criticize and pick on her and be at her because she would come downstairs and her hair would be like, boo! <laughs> and I'd be a good dad. I'm like, I'm not letting you go out like that. Get upstairs and fix your hair. And she said, Dad, I've been spending 45 minutes doing this. And I'm like, go spend another 45 minutes doing it then. <laughs> Little did I know that God was preparing and training her to do what she does as a living. This people, she has a full book of women that go down to her basement and say, do my hair. So I was way off there, wasn't I? So who would have known? Okay, who would have known if we would have been more, became more supported by what she does? I know you guys are like, oh, you're pretty brave, man. She doesn't live with me anymore, so I don't care about this guy. Her, huh? But she lives right across the street. But we've got to be praying. We've got to be interceding. There's a spiritual warfare going on out there. In Ephesians chapter 6, let's turn there real quick. Let's read the word of God there. I was talking to a lady yesterday. And there is a spiritual battle going on. And we need to be aware of that. And as believers, we need to be interceding on people's behalf that, that we're standing against wickedness, that we're standing against darkness, we're standing against Satan and his attackers. We've got to do that. As a church, we've got to do that for us. Because see, the more successful we get, the more excited we get, the more people start coming into church, the more attack we're going to be under. And I know what your pastor said, let them come on. It's good when the devil, some people say, oh, we got to rebuke him and cast him off. You know, it's good when you're getting the devil's attention when you're doing what you need to be doing for God. Okay? That's, that's the amazing thing. He can't do anything to you because you have the power of the blood. You have the power of Christ. You have the power of prayer. But we've got to know that. That's intercessory prayer. Those times, people, you come and stand in the gap against the spirits of darkness, you've got to be prepared for that. You can't just take that lightly. Okay? Because the devil's real. He's powerful. He's got, he's got a lot of power, doesn't he? And if you're not careful, you're not carrying the full armor of God, what can the devil do to you? He can slip those darts in there. Okay? That dart of doubt. That dart of worry. That dart of anxiety. Okay? That doubt, that dart of, that God really didn't do a work in you. All those darts are start getting in there because you're not fully dressing yourself up. That's intercession. 
That's when you pray, Lord, I need the whole armor of God around me. I need to be in the Word. I need to be in prayer. I need to be aware. I need to do it rightly. I need to do it your way. That's the key thing. Ephesians, let's read. I'm going to read this, and we'll close with this. Starting verse 10, chapter 6. You have to be aware. And again, you know, as I get ready to read that, Hollywood has done a good job of desensitizing us, hasn't it? Isn't it amazing what Hollywood's done with the devil to make us believe there is no devil? It's just a figment of our imagination. But if you get in the Word of God, you'll find out the devil's real. The devil came in Christ. The devil tripped up Adam and Eve in the garden. The devil's no joke. The devil does not want you victorious. You've got to believe that. You've got to be in prayer for that. When you see somebody in the church that might be down about something, you go take time and be sure to talk to that person. They might be coming under some attack. Okay? You need to know how to pray for that person. You need to stand in the gap and bind and rebuke and cast off. That's Bible. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. It's only a good thing. That's a Pentecostal thing. Any Pentecostal thing. That's a Bible thing. That's a God thing. You don't do it because some faction is doing it. You do it because the Word of God says to do it. Okay? Here's the challenge. Starting in verse 10, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, what? may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The Bible right there warning you to prepare yourself, to cover yourself, to be aware that there's a devil out there that doesn't want you victorious. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, okay? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Now here we go. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, have your shoes and your feet, uh, have shoes for your feet. Uh, pardon me, let me get back here. I'm getting used to this new Bible. And have shoes and your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, but you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take on the helm of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplications to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. That's pretty plain. That scripture is put in there to warn us of what we're really fighting against. When we come in the body of Christ, okay, sometimes we get bumping heads with each other. We think that's where the battle's at. That's not. When there becomes those kind of things in the body of Christ, and you're doing what the Word of God tells you to do, and all of a sudden there's some kind of conflict, right there someone needs to be going into intercessory prayer, praying the spirits of darkness out of there. And one thing I didn't do this morning that I normally do before I come into this building is I pray, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would Proceed us into that place. Drive out any spirit of wickedness, any spirit of darkness, anything that would distract anybody from hearing your truth. I didn't do that this morning. I'm hoping somebody did, though. Because, see, I should be able to trust the body of Christ to pick up some of the slack that I forget sometimes. Amen? Because why? Because we're all commanded to do this. It's not just the pastor's responsibility. It's my responsibility to do what? Pray, be in the Word of God, study, preach it, okay? And let the Word of God, and pray the Word of God convict your heart so that you do what? Act upon it. If we're coming here just to get entertained, okay, that's not going to happen. We're not Hollywood. I don't have all the bells and whistles and all that kind of stuff like that. But if you're coming here wanting to get the Word of God and finding out how I can live my life better for God, then that's what we're here for. But that's what we need to be praying about. But there's an evilness out there. They want our kids. The devil doesn't want our kids. I mean, start to over there a little. Sometimes you think, well, that child is going through the terrible things. Might not be. Might be the devil picking out a problem. To do what? Keep you stirred up. Okay? So you get angry at him instead of loving him through it. See, Ryan and Jennifer probably got a lot more spanking than I could have loved them through. Now, Jerry doesn't think so. <laughs> Yeah, I got a brave son-in-law. 
You know, he'll say things in front of Jennifer like you should spank her a whole lot more. <laughs> And you, know, and you know how I get about spanked? I get excited. I'm like, it's not too late. <laughs> but don't ever think, if you are living in a godly home, and you're being godly parents, and you're doing what you need to be doing for God, don't think that your children have all the protection you think they do. Don't think that. We need to be covering those kids. We need to be covering our family. Dad, you need to be covering your kids. You need to be covering your family. The devil wants those kids. Okay? The devil wants those kids. We as a church have a responsibility. Not to pray just for our families and our kids, but for the church as a whole. Okay? One thing I liked about reading that book, Experiencing God Together, was the, was the challenge to pray and reconcile. Pray and reconcile. When you see a problem, you pray about that problem. Okay, you don't point your finger down that problem, they're probably going through that. You pray and you reconcile. You bring that person back. The Bible tells us to do that. If there's a brother in sin, what do you do? You don't condemn them. You don't kick them out right away. Sometimes you get point, pulled to that point. But what we do is we start praying. We approach that person. We love that person through this. You know what gives a conviction person more than anything? When they think no one knows they're doing anything wrong. And you lovingly go up to them and say, man, I know you're struggling. I know you're going through some things. You ever look at someone's face when you do that? Now, sometimes they'll get things right. Sometimes they don't. That's their choice. But it's our responsibility to be what? To be prayed up. To be where we need to be with God. So that we can see those things in the body of Christ. To head off anything the devil wants to do. To cause any kind of division. Any kind of pain. Any kind of hurt. To distract us from doing what we're called to do. And that's what? Preach the gospel. I'm not a socialized pastor. I don't get caught up too much in all the social and all the issues out there. My philosophy is this. You want to change the world? Get a person saved. Okay? We're not going to change the groups. We're not going to do those things. But I'll tell you what. You can change one soul at a time. That's what we need to be praying about. The church is missing that whole gamut of things. We're throwing the baby out with the bathwater when we can be praying and getting people saved. What does the scripture here say? God's plan is he wants people saved. We get caught up in the issues, guess what we do? We kind of forget where God's part is in that, and we stop praying, and we start cleaning, then we start meddling, and that's not our job. We need to be praying. We need to be interceding. We need to be hungry and burdened for souls. That's what praying is all about. And we're where we're at with God and where we need to be with Him in fellowship with Him, that's going to be our heart's desire for anything in the world that people will get saved. People come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for slowing me down. I mean, I got sped up again. But Father, we thank you for that. I thank you for this church that, that Father, that, that loves me and, and, and tolerates me and, and Father, puts up with that 100 mile an hour Speaking that I do, I thank you for them. I love them. They love me and I know that. Father, I'm so grateful that, that they know that they can stop and say, Pastor, you need to slow down. Pastor, we want to hear clearly what you're saying. And, and, and there's no offense. And you know people love you. And you know people are praying for you. Lord, you come back up and regroup and say, thank you for helping me. Thank you for knowing that I'm not better than you. That I'm perfect. That I'm not perfect. That I need help. I need encouragement. I need to do it correctly also. It's great to have a family of God that, that keeps me focused. I thank you for that. Father, I pray for this church as a whole. Father, I thank you that we've been able to be so involved and able to do so many things, but it's only because we've expressed our faith to you in prayer. We've trusted you, we've believed you, we've waited on you. We thank you. And Father, this, I just pray that that we continue to see that, that what's happened in this place is because of the faith that we've exhibited in you, trusting in you to provide for us so that we can do and work in the lost and dying world and be who we need to be to them. That we don't get caught up with the issues, we don't get caught up with the buildings, we don't get caught up with those things that would distract us and keep us from serving you in a great way. Father, speak to hearts. I pray, Father, this morning, if someone needs prayer, if someone needs a touch, 
Father, I pray that we move now. They just come forward right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, by faith, expecting to, to and believing you for their healing, believing you for their deliverance. Move that person. If there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior this morning, Lord, they come forward that, that, that we have people that, that will talk with them, share with them. Give them the gospel. Father, and guide them to you. Use the Iron Faith Church. Father, I just pray that all we do and say would always bring you honor and glory and praise. I thank you for Thomas and Evan for their time, for driving up, Lord, in their hearts. Father, honor that. Thank you. Anoint them, bless them, use them. Father, give them the helpers and workers that they need. Father, they're here. Father, speak to hearts. Father, speak to hearts. In Jesus' name. Our young people need people that love them, need people that want to give them the gospel. Father, it's in all these things we 